So you guys knew that uh, there is ATM malware, right? Like malware specifically created for uh, ATM machines. Uh, who here uh, was aware of this kind of malware? Right? Everybody. And um, my first uh, hint was uh, I moved back to Ireland uh, like in 2006. And when I lived in Spain, all of those uh, terminals were like the old kind of terminals like AS400 mainframe kind of ATMs. Do you remember those in, in green? It was, they look really, really old. And when I moved to Ireland, suddenly I saw, you know, like Windows environments in the ATM. And you could suspect that there was an ATM with Windows because you could see every now and then these errors, you know? And uh, all of the security specialists, Back then, and I'm talking about 2005, 2006, we all said, wow, this, this is going to spell doom. This is just going to be a, a disaster anytime. And yet, we started seeing the disaster happening like a couple of years ago, not before. So for me, it's very really surprising. You know, from 2006, I've been expecting it's like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's going to be something big. And only now we're seeing it. And, uh, yeah, it is uh, really becoming mainstream. Um, is it something to worry yet? I mean, do you guys need to be worried when you go to the next ATM to retrieve money that uh, fearing that uh, you, your data is going to be picked up? Probably not yet, right? I mean, it, it happens often, but when it happens, well, I'm in space. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, but when it happens, uh, it makes it to the media. And I'll, I'll show examples of uh, instances when attacks of this have happened, and you really hear it. I mean, they happen every now and then, but when, when they happen, woo, everybody knows. Um, this is another example. This is a more recent one. This one, I love it. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's from the UK. You know, if you don't see it there, it says, uh, your password has expired. Please change it. Okay, yeah. How do I change that? And, um, there's three reasons we believe that uh, this trend has been picking up lately. These three reasons, I, we believe that it's uh, the, the, the main core of the question, right? The why. Uh, one is that the, the bad guys, they have no problem attacking exotic platforms. And I'm meaning exotic with quotes, right? Because this is not really exotic. We're talking Windows, right? But Windows with different hardware, with different stuff, they have no problem. Like 10 years ago, you wouldn't see that many attacks on, on strange platforms. Right now, they're taking on like POS, that's uh, points of, uh, of sale, those uh, uh, strange the special devices. We're seeing mobile uh, hardware being attacked. We're seeing all sorts of hardware being attacked. Now, ATM is a bit more difficult, right? Because, you know, if I, if I want to attack an Android, I just get a hold on Android and study it. What do they do with the ATMs? Well, they're, they're, they're doing that. Precisely that. They just take an ADM, steal it, steal the whole thing. Oh, we're seeing that, you know. Uh, I'll tell you later about the story of an arrest. And uh, when they took over the guys, you know, they, they went into the house. The police arrested them in the house. And the house, of course, it had all sorts of development, devices and stuff. And there were two ATMs. Two AT they just picked up the ATMs, bring them home and start analyzing and seeing what's in there, what the protections are, what they look like, what kind of architecture they're using. They're doing that. So right now, this is one of the things that uh, the bad guys are doing. It's just, you know, they're very bold. I need to attack that? Well, I'll pick it up and study it. So they're very bold. The second one is that they're dealing with Windows XP. I mean, XP. It's from 2001. So we're talking uh, about a 15-year-old, uh, more, more than that, uh, almost 16-year-old uh, operating system. So the guys at this point are very skilled, are doing everything with uh, Windows XP. That, that's pretty good for them. And uh, the third reason is that uh, Microsoft, and I'm not pointing bad fingers, I think Microsoft did a good thing. Microsoft created something called the uh, Extended Financial Services, which is some sort of middleware API that makes the bank's lives much easier. It means that in order for a bank to develop hardware, not, not hardware, software for the ATM and communicate with the uh, special devices that ATMs are, they just need to communicate with that middleware and that middleware communicates directly with the hardware. So the bank needs to just, when you configure an ATM, install this XFS layer, so that it communicates uh, appropriately with uh, with a card reader, with the cassettes and, and the money, with a camera, with the alarms, if it has 
everything is abstracted. If there's an abstraction layer so that the program only needs to use those APIs. It's like, okay, retrieve the pin code. That's it. That's great, right? Because the developers, for them, is just calling an API and they don't care if uh, if the brand of the ATM is A or B or C. They just don't care. They just make a one single API call. Now, the developers, a boon. They're very happy. The bad guys, super happy because they, they don't need to care about what the underlying hardware is. They just say, okay, give me the, give me the, the that whole track to uh, data from the uh, from the car that the user just plugged in all in great just you know really really good XFS has been a uh, great advance for developers for the banks great advance for developers of uh, of malware and now we're at that point at, a, at that junction where everybody is very happy except for the banks because they're seeing these attacks massively I mean not very often but when they happen they are Amazing. And you'll see examples of that later. Uh, so, as shocking as it is, the way in to an ATM is usually this. So, the guy walks near an ATM. Normally, it's going to be one that is not in the bank, right? In a mall or some isolated area, some sort of 7-Eleven in the back. They just open with a special key. Those keys are usually not uh, not unique. So, it's the same key that opens the whole bunch of ATMs for the whole network. They just open, access the main board, and then they access either the USB or they access uh, the CD reader. So they put a CD, boot the machine, and boot into a special XP or in, in a special Windows environment. Then they mount the whole system as a, as a unit, and then they modify it because, you know, the, the, the Windows XP, the original Windows XP from the machine is not running. It's another separate machine uh, which means that they can modify it at will they can just add stuff so that the next time it reboots the machine is infected so as easy as that we're seeing that with cds dvds and we're seeing that with usbs so they just plug in a pen drive reboot the machine infect it. that that thing it, it looks super complicated right but the, of course the guys are you know, minimally good at this. So they have managed to script this. So the whole operation takes about five minutes. So they just need to just open, plug in, reboot, the scripts run. Okay, reboot again, close, the machine is infected. Now we'll see what happens when the machine is infected, which is pretty unusual, but this is the way in. I mean, amazing. Now, of course, I have to tell you that there's a, another way in, another possible way in, which is if you manage to take over the network of the bank, then you, you could jump into the special network. Normally, they're protected by VPNs, right? So you could manage to, if you have the right credentials, to jump through the network. It has happened, but this is much easier. I mean, if the guys have the right key, and normally the keys are just the round kind that just open and, and that's it, right? Then um, what the guys do is they, they, they look at banks that have this protection and they just open one, jackpot the whole machine, go to the next one in the same neighborhood, do it again, do it again, do it again. They spend the whole weekend doing this, millions of uh, pounds, euros, dollars, whatever, and then they go home. So super easy for from their point of view. Now what they want it's uh, as, as I already mentioned, you know, jackpotting the machine. It's just you know, machine give me everything. They check all the, the cassettes, the money cassettes, and they manage to empty the whole machine. That's the most obvious one, but it's not the only one. Why? Because this one it's a one-off. You only get one chance. You empty the machine, whatever. Normally these machines uh, will have between 100, 150,000 euros a pop, which is it's a decent amount of money, right? <laughs> it's not bad. Now, the other one, it's uh, virtual skimming. You know what skimming is, right? Skimming is putting a device on top of the ATM so that when the user puts in the, the pin and the card, then those devices pick up the track data and pick up the pin code because the, you know, the user is keying it in over the fake uh, keyboard. Uh, now, if you have control over the whole system, then you might as well put a keylogger that does all that. And the advantage of, uh, the advantage of that is that uh, the bank is not going to notice because 
of course, if I jackpot the machine, the bank notices. You know, it's like, wow, a machine is empty and I have no transactions, something's wrong. They send the technician, they put that machine off the network and they probably destroy the machine. It, it lasts for one day. It's a one, it's a one, uh, one trick and that's it. Now, if you manage to do the virtual skimming to put a keylogger that, that logs every single transaction, then the bank doesn't know. You can have these things going on forever. And then every, every day, every week or every month, the guy just gets the machine. Okay. These are the logs from the latest transactions. And then he clones those uh, credit cards and then sells them away. This is happening. So both we have jackpotting and we have virtual skimming, both going on at the same time. And uh, I'll go for the families. There aren't that many. So this is not a, not a major issue. <laughs> All right. Uh, number one, this is the granddaddy. This is the oldest one. So when I said 2006, we didn't think. Actually, from 2009, Skymer came along. Skymer is a, it was jackpotting back then and it was, uh, it was found in Russia and the Ukraine. So you think this probably an Eastern European origin, right? That's what we thought, right? It's just, Attacking Debold. This was way before XFS, before the extended financial services for Microsoft. And, uh, and of course it had to target this specific API from one vendor. The vendor that was attacked in this time is Debold. So only Debold ATMs were affected and are affected by this thing. This is the granddaddy, but still alive and kicking. We are seeing still this stuff in the wild with different modifications, a little bit, uh, more developed, but this thing is out there still. And uh, you'd think, okay, this is Eastern European, right? Not so much. In 2011, then, we saw the same code base, but instead of just doing jackpotting, it's doing virtual skimming. It stays there. It waits for the bad guy to come with a special card. He inserts the card, and then he gets into a special menu. And among the things in the menu, it's put everything you have logged into the car. It dumps all of the credit cards uh, into the card, and then the guy steps away with the card. That card has a dump of everything, every transaction that has happened from an ATM. Then the guy, of course, sells those uh, credit card numbers in the in the underground. And um, so we have two code bases. 2009, clearly, clearly jackpotting Russia, the Ukraine. 2011, only virtual skimming, but this was found in Brazil in Brazil and uh, in Mexico. So it's very South American. Why is it very South American? Because in the installation routines, all those special strings like nah, you don't have privileges, you, you, have, you need the root privileges to install, everything is in Spanish, everything. So you think, mm, Ukrainians haven't made this. So you might think maybe some code base originally from the Ukraine made it into you know, somehow somewhere in Latin America and the Latin Americans have started, have continued development. Maybe it's to anyone's guess. I have no idea. This is, uh, we believe right now it's uh, being developed in Latin America, but we have no idea. And we're seeing it to this day. In fact, I have some, uh, some samples that I received that I need to check up. And I think that there's more stuff like the latest ones. Uh, they're using uh, alternate uh, data streams, which is, you know, to, to hide files, I have no idea why. I guess the, they're fearing that the banks are, are seeing it, but the banks, they have a hard time because a, a normal bank will have a network of thousands and thousands of ATMs, so they cannot send a technician even once a month, even once a year, just to check if something's up. Unless there's an alarm, they don't check those machines. So, but, but it's being developed. So number two, we have Plotus, and uh, this is again, Found in 2013, imagine the leap, 2009, 2011, then 2013. Well, we're, from 2009, from the granddaddy, we're only seeing the second one pretty recently, 2013. So this is picking up now. Uh, Plotus, the only objective is jackpotting, so it only takes cash. No virtual skimming, no logging, anything. And again, since this is from before uh, the API, the XFS API, it aims only at one vendor, which is NCR. Now, I would not be amazed if something surfaces that is Plotus for Debold or Plotus for any other vendor. 
it may be. We only have seen this. We have, bear in mind that we have a very hard time getting those samples because um, either they delete themselves at some point and then you can't get to them, or if the bank is lucky enough to get those samples, they don't necessarily share it with us. So we have a hard time seeing samples. I'm only seeing sample from NCR, so I have to assume that these guys are only targeting NCR. Why? Probably because it's very common in Latin America. Latin America, uh, NCR and DBOL, apparently in, in Mexico at least, they're very common. Clearly Latin American. And uh, the nice thing about this one, I don't know how they, they came with this idea, right? But uh, it supports not only a menu, which when it's infected, the, the, the bad guy gets a menu, right? And on screen, he can take uh, retrieve all the money. Give me everything. And he gets everything. But it also supports commands through SMS, which means that the bad guys have to hook an, a phone into the, into the machine, put it in, close the machine, and then at some point, text so that it gets the money. Now, the bad guys probably thought, okay, this is great because we can reuse and reuse and reuse every time by sending text, and then tomorrow they fill it up, and then we, we empty it again. Doesn't happen. I mean, the, the banks see this and it's like, out, out, this ATM is out of the network, and they, they bring it home. So, of course, even though it might seem like a good idea, it, it's actually giving more hints to the police as to who's behind, right? Because you're leaving behind more stuff with uh, fingerprints and with stuff. So, mm, it's a nice idea. You sh it goes to show that the guys are developing and they're creative, but nothing much more. I mean, it's interesting not really useful for them. Um, number three, and again, South America. We know it's South America because we're seeing it in South America. It might come from somewhere else, but we think it's South America. It's Green Dispenser. I don't know who names these things. You know, green Dispenser. <laughs> so this one was first found in 2015. You're seeing how most of them have been found 2015, and you'll see 2016 too. So. It's picking up speed right now in this uh, in these last few months, and we expect the future to be like boom, much more, because the guys are seeing that this is relatively simple. It's not that difficult, and they're starting to develop this. So the banks need really to spruce up here. Um, this one is very similar, cash, but with a big difference. This one uses XFS because this is relatively recent. The sample that we saw. It seems to be targeting only Winkor Nixdorf, which is another ATM vendor, but through XFS. It means that it uses those parts of XFS that are specific to Winkor installations. So, you know, it's, it's different. We're seeing that the, there's more development here. The, the guys, uh, to me, even though it uses a different uh, programming language than the previous, than Plotus, it looks similar. So it, it's not crazy to think that it's either a spun-off um, subgroup from the previous one or perhaps a rival gang, you know, another gang that's, oh, these guys are doing it. I'm doing it too because it brings a lot of money. It may be. And uh, clearly Latin America, somewhere in Latin America. So I'm, I said South America, but I should have said Latin America because a lot of them are in uh, Mexico. So Mexico technically is North America, but Latin America and we understand each other. Um, now, these are, this is for the Latin American part. You can see a theme going on there, right? There must be a few gangs there that are operating pretty much in the same way. It might be the same gang developing three branches, Diebold uh, for NCR and for Winkor Nixdorf. It might be rival gangs. They might not, not even know each other. We have no idea. The fourth one, it's a departure from, the, from these ones. The fourth one, uh, they called it Neo Pocket, was found by a consultancy firm in Spain because they have a lot of customers in Latin America and it was found in Central America of all places and it was, it, this is very specific so this thing only attacked Debo machines because that's where we found it but it knew exactly the protection software that the machine had so the ATM was protected by a wide listing uh, application so it knew how to except make an exception of itself of the of the malware into the into the, this particular knowing the path knowing everything of this spe uh, specific machine um these guys who found it they were very lucky to find it 
because it had an expiration date. So this thing had like a campaign, a particular amount of time, I think it was like uh, six months, and after six months, it would delete itself. So it was super targeted. It knew exactly what kind of ATM they were going to, what kind of protection software it, it was running, everything. And it was also limited in time. And this is just purely virtual skimming. So it was just gathering data only. There was no money involved. So this thing would have lived there. It probably did live there for the full amount of time. Imagine all of those ATMs from this particular bank for the full six months living there and, you know, get, getting, getting, getting data. You know, it, it, anybody is subject to that. We think that uh, it had some, some amount of uh, insider knowledge, right? It doesn't happen by chance. Either they, the, the bad guys paid somebody to know all the exact uh, protection and, and all the installation, or mm, some insider did it itself, himself, you know? It, it may be, it may be. And in any case, this is, uh, this is pretty scary, because uh, if you tell this to banks, it dawns on them the notion that they, they could have any amount of ATMs infected by these kind of things and they would have no idea. No idea and no way of knowing other than just stepping into the ATM and, and checking if there's something, something strange running, which is really not, not doable, right? If you have like 5,000 ATMs throughout the country, you cannot send a technician to all of them just to run some process. Let's see if Process Explorer finds something. That's not doable. Uh, again, Latin America. Now, number five, um, we call it pat pin. Most of them call it pat, pat pin. Pin pat, the other way around. I don't know who comes up with these names, really. <laughs> 2014, and uh, it was seen in, uh, in Russia, isolated parts of Russia. Objective is purely cash. It's only just jackpot and give me the money. And uh, it only aims NCR. I'm pretty sure that it also aims, uh, there's versions who aim at other, uh, at other vendors, but uh, the ones we've seen, it's a NCR. Purely Eastern Europe. Now, uh, there's another name for this uh, out there. We call Tupkin. Now, the interesting thing about this one, if, if you notice, this is the only one that uh, hints at Eastern European origin, right? But the, the interesting thing about this one is that uh, the arrests that have been made by law enforcement agencies have been here, right? And you see that the bad guys are actually, actually licensing the software to gangs. The gangs are taking the money, risking themselves, getting arrested in the process, some of them. But the developer is nowhere to be seen. We have no idea who the developer is, but it's clearly Eastern European because of, you know, the, there's uh, stuff in Cyrillic inside and, and we started seeing it in Russia way, way in 2014. And uh, the funny thing is that, you know, the, it, the developer, it's selling it or licensing it to others. Now, how do, how do the developers know, how, how can they control the, um, the spreading of this thing, right? That uh, these guys don't give it to somebody else. Now, the licensing, there you go. <laughs> the licensing works this way. And this is, this is a tendency among all of them. Uh, so the way it works is the guy in front of the machine opens the machine, infects, closes, and then they have a special menu. And then the first thing that the malware does is say, okay, give me a special key. Now the guy has no idea with the special key because it's time-based, it's time-dependent. So the guy has to call the boss of the gang and say, hey, what's the time? What, when, what's, the, what's the key? Okay, the key right now is blah, they give him a small little string. And then only then they can take the money. So the guy controls exactly who's retrieving the money and how much money. That's the way they control it. So it's a, some sort of a licensing scheme that the, these guys have, which is kind of funny if you think about it. I mean, even the bad guys don't trust each other, which, you know, <laughs> honor among pirates, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll put examples of a pad pin because this is the one that has been uh, not technically researched. Technically, they're not super complex, other than that you need an ATM if you really want to run things with uh, XFS and everything. If you don't have an ATM, then it just doesn't run, right? But you can suspect. You look at the code and you can suspect. So technically, you can get a look at the code without uh, without much problem. Now. 
law enforcement have, have been able to get these guys. And I'll show examples later. It's really, really cool. Now, number six, it's from August 2016. And this one, we have no idea. It's, it's pretty new. So it's just cash. It was a one attack, one big attack in, uh, in Thailand back in August. If you're, uh, if you're onto new, the news, this kind of news, it was pretty, pretty big back then. The guys just, you know, sweeped a lot of ATMs in, uh, in one weekend and managed to get a lot of money. Um, no idea. There's no hints inside. The only thing that I have, of course, is not Thai. I would not believe that it's Thai. Uh, by the model, I'd say Eastern European, and I'll tell you why later in the, in the next slide. But um, as the only hint that we have here is that in the code, it's one misspelling. Cassette, you see that it's missing a T. Normally, cassette should have two T's. So either the, buy, the guy is very bad speller or Portuguese. he's Portuguese, exactly. <laughs> Portuguese or Brazilian. Yeah. So that's the only hint. It may be. We have no idea. Now, the model, this model that, uh, that we're hinting here are going to one country, sweeping a bunch of ATMs and going back home, a country totally unrelated to your own country, is being used in Patpin. And this is the example. This is the guy that was, uh, that was uh, arrested, right? So this was an attack in the, to the UK. It was one weekend. It was one holiday, uh, you know, that the, the UK, whenever there's a holiday, they move it to Mondays. They, they don't have, you know, just to allow, to not to allow people to have very long weekends. They're nasty that way. <laughs> so on a, on a holiday uh, weekend, so it was a, an extended weekend, three days back in 2014, the guys went over London and uh, around London, so a couple of neighborhoods around London, so 1.6 million in a weekend of pounds. You know, the pound in 2016, uh, 2014 was more than, than it's worth today. Um, just, you know, a lot of money. Just a lot of money in, in one single weekend. Now, the, the SOCA, that's the, the law enforcement agency in the UK, they were investigating this stuff. They had no idea, you know, how to go about it. They got a hint uh, that this guy was, uh, was onto it. They followed him. They, they arrested the guy. And uh, the guy just entered the UK from somewhere else. He was not even from the UK. So that was the first hint, you know. Somebody's licensing this pat pin thing. They were teaching them how to do it. So there were like some sort of, uh, you know, instructions or, or training or whatever. And then the, 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 the little gang would go to one unrelated, completely unrelated uh, country and you just attack, get all the money, get into the airplane and go back home. This guy, uh, um, I think he was, uh, he's Georgian, but he was based in Romania or Moldova or, or somewhere in, in Eastern Europe, not, uh, not Russia and the Ukraine. So that was the model. That was the first hint of the model. Now, the same thing happened in Malaysia. Again, same kind of like Thailand, like I was telling you earlier, right? This was uh, verified that this is Patpin. So they went to Malaysia. They took a lot of money and went back home. Now, we we're not sure who it was, but I've heard that this data, this, this fact, right? The same guy here, Grigori Paladi, was in Malaysia the same weekend that uh, the attack happened. It's not demonstrated that it's him, but, you know, it looks likely. Uh, so Kuala Lumpur, that's, uh, that's the police. Malaysian police is telling you this stuff. It's very small, so I'm going to blow it up a bit. We believe that he continued his crime spree, he, the criminal, in several countries before fleeing to London. He went to London, of course. Um, more theft like this has happened in United uh, Kingdom, Russia, Malaysia, Germany, and Canada. So none of these attacks have, have, been, have made it to the news, but, you know, Malaysian police is telling us that they have happened. So I don't know if they have happened, but apparently they have. So these guys are acting exactly in that way. The same people is just going to one country, sweeping in money, and going back home. That's what I was saying, that even though I have no idea who the ripper, number six, the author was, or, or the gang behind was, but it looks very much in line with this kind of strategy. So I would say it looks Eastern European. I can't say, but it looks. 
Now, January 2016, the Romanian police arrested the whole gang, one whole gang that was doing this in Romania. That was in January. So they went to the house and they saw the whole thing and everything. And uh, they arrested the whole, the whole gang. It was like uh, seven people involved, I, I seem to believe. And uh, the whole gang, there was no developer. There was no development here happening at all. All right. And uh, so there was no development. The guys were just licensing the software. They were just getting it from somewhere, do, um, doing, getting the training, knowing how to attack, performing the attack, and going back home. So that was another hint. Now, as many arrests as we can get here, we see that these guys are moving a lot. They're moving through the Russian underground or the Russian speaking underground, but they are not the developers themselves. The developers themselves are not exposing or not getting exposed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually worse with that. <laughs> I will take it off. All right. All right. I'm actually worse with this because I move a lot. <laughs> so um, I usually finish this one um, giving recommendations. <laughs> Maybe it's me. <laughs> I attract the waves. Maybe. All right. Here. All right. Um, giving recommendations to to others. Uh, normally, uh, the recommendations are pretty straightforward, right? Everybody in the security industry, the first thing you, you, you notice about this is physical security. Don't use those keys that one single key can open the whole network. It just doesn't make sense. Now, it might seem obvious to us, but it's not so obvious to banks. Why? Because if it's difficult to have one guy go to the middle of uh, you know whatever countryside location and open imagine how difficult it would be if every single one of those atm had a different one so a different uh, key it would mean that they would have to go to a central location where all the keys are go to the okay pick one this uh, for the street a and then go to street a open it and then go back to the central location and put it there and with central locations we're talking about different countries i mean different cities in, in the same country so it would make their, their their logistically their work that much more difficult so i understand that but still it's it's not very good so physical security um i would say also um if you don't need a usb a usb port in the main board don't put a usb port just you know it, it's not it, Honestly, it's not needed. CD, DVD, do you really need that? Do you need to make it bootable? Probably not, right? Offline security refers to exactly that, all those measures that can be taken uh, offline, right? Uh, the firmware, uh, you know, don't make, uh, don't make the, the BIOS accessible. Don't make uh, the, any external uh, devices bootable. Pretty obvious to us, right? For them, it would mean if you have a 10,000 or 5,000 ATM network, going to each one of them and establish policies. That takes money, that takes effort. So until it happens more and they're whipped in the butt a couple of times and like, oh, I lost 1.6 million. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm going to start new policy here. It will start happening. And uh, of course, online security, um, you know, put your, your VPNs, which are probably already there, firewalls, um, you name it, anything that is on top of the operating system once the operating system has booted. Wide listing solutions, they're there, they're being used. Mm, they're no guarantee because if you can boot from a separate operating system, then it doesn't matter how many firewalls and ITS and IPS and, and it doesn't matter because you own the system. So this is for, by order of, of importance. I would go first for physical, then offline and then online. Um, a big one, for instance, would be 
to have the operating system or the whole disk encrypted so that even if you boot from outside, then you won't be able to mount it and, and modify stuff. So that would be a, b a big one. I understand it's a huge pain in the ass for them, but I think it would be it would bring a lot of uh, very good security. And uh, and this is pretty much my message. You know, ATM malware exists. So mm, do we need to be concerned about it? We as users, not so much. You know, we as a security industry, mm, as a curiosity so far. The financial industry, definitely, you bet. They need, really need to be on top of this. You know, they really do. That's pretty much it. Thanks very much. I do have time for questions, right? Sure. Scary, yeah? <laughs> So, um, at the end of the day, the, the vendor, they just create the case and put the hardware. And it's up to the bank to do all that stuff. So, you, you can do it that way. Definitely, you can. But even though those, those things exist, for practical purposes, they're not going to be implemented in every case. Why? I'll tell you why. Because when you have an ADM in-house, in the bank, then normally it has the camera, the alarm, and everything. But when you set up an ATM which is isolated in the middle of a mall, or, or I don't know, in some vendor in some 7-Eleven somewhere, if you put an alarm, the 7-Eleven guy is going to be like, what happened? I have no idea what to do. Yeah, not the local alarm, the remote alarm. It doesn't matter. What, what would it do? I mean, in, in five minutes, that's precisely, I mean, it's, it's not impossible. And in fact, a lot of times it is implemented, but precisely the ATMs that they're targeting are the ones who are most likely to be unattended. So even if there was such an alarm in those remote locations, they would never reach in time. Like five minutes, I get to my menu, call, what's the number? Here's the number. How many cassettes? How, many, how much money? Give me everything cassette A, everything cassette B, everything cassette C. Grab the money, out. And they even have, in those menus, they have an option of secure deletion. So delete everything. So it deletes itself, and the, it, it leaves no remnants. So the bad guys, I mean, that the, the bank knows that something has happened. They go there. They try to do some forensics. They don't see anything. They don't get any samples. So that's why it's so rare for me to get samples. I'm, I'm really struggling sometimes. I suspect that there are samples, like those uh, Plotus. I would suspect very strongly that there's a version of Plotus that attacks uh, Wink or Nixdoor for, or any other vendor. And I'm not seeing it. No. But yeah, definitely. The, the, the hardware, definitely support it. The implementation, down to the bank. Yeah, there was a question over there, right? You talked about the virtual scheming uh, style of attacking, and uh, I want to know uh, to clarif clarify something. Uh, the target there is uh, just the credit card numbers, right? Because uh, when you dial your your PIN, uh, the 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 key is uh, is embedded in hardware, so it's impossible to get the PIN. For it's EMV, yes. For EMV, it's the encrypted uh, P, uh, P, PIN pad. I, I say so many times, pad PIN. That sometimes. <laughs> Pin pad. It is the encrypted okay. pin pad. So what happens is that there's an encrypted version of it. So you enter your pin, and that's uh, that's encrypted. So the 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 pad encrypts it, yes. sends it somewhere to the to a central location in a database, and then it says yes or no. Yes. So you cannot pick it up. Yes. You, you would so only get the whole track one, track track two, and track three. Yes. So the so the target data. is it's the yes. the credit card number. If there's no EMV, so imagine in the U.S then that might, uh, anything that is encoded in might be. So if the pin is, you pick okay. it up. Okay, oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're right. It, yeah, it, thank yeah, you. I've, I've seen that uh, that question before, and you're totally right. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hello, I got a very specific question. Uh, you said the developers themselves were licensing the, um, the software to the, to the rings, right? Uh, so uh, how would they, um, what did they use the as a 
as a password. So was it something like Google Authenticator that would generate a, a one-time password or something like that? Let me see. This, I don't know why this didn't come up, right? Do you see this, uh, this the licensing? It's uh, yeah. just as, as an aside, right, uh, on that story. This, is, uh, this has been seen by some consultant in, in Russia, in a Russian underground. This, this is the, the advertisement from whoever selling tube. Tubekin, Pat Pin. Oh yeah, uh, uh, I thought and, uh, you. It's, it's about th five thousand dollars to encrypt. I thought you were able to to, to take a look at uh, the at the sample of that code. So that was so what I was. licensing. We don't really know how they're licensed oh, okay. to each one of the guys. What we know is how each gang is able to control the food soldiers in front of the ATM. Yeah. So those uh, those codes are usually completely randomish, kind of like time-based. Let me show you an example of one of them. Yeah, that would, they would sync a secret well, with see, the yeah, computer and generate it through the machine's local pretty. time. It's not very pretty, but it's, it's some sort of uh, base, base 64 thing. So the bad guy would see that. That's a QR code, and that QR code the codes to this thing. Yeah. This thing, if if it's uh if you do base sixty four straight, it doesn't work. I mean, it's just bytes. It, it, it's probably not that. So I think that it's uh, either a custom base sixty four, so the alphabet yeah. has been scrambled, or maybe it's bits and bytes. I have no idea. But uh, <coughs> the guy, the guy just gives a, a screenshot. This is what I'm seeing. This is the input. So you don't and really see give him the code. Just, you know stuff that for, to me doesn't make sense. Yeah. So there has to be some sort of uh, special app on the phone that they use, and they pick this up, and then the other guy returns some time-based code. Yeah. Okay, right, thanks. But by the way, this originally is not there. Just put it there just to, to show what it uh, decodes to. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the banks can't go to every single ATM to check what what is running there, Process Explorer and the like. But can't they? Aren't the ATMs connected to network? Can't the bank connect to the ATMs and somehow? I'm assuming there aren't rootkits that can intercept the things that they can see. But are the are these banks trying to read remotely the information of the ATM? So or I don't work for a bank, so I can't really you know. know if, so okay. this is absolutely bank specific. Some banks. I know for a fact that they have very complex systems of managing ATMs, down to even seeing whether they've been compromised or the, the, if the disk encryption is still running and running fine. And, and there are some completely unmanaged. So it comes down to the budget of the bank. If they have more budget and they want to spend, they are products. Some smaller banks, they might not have the money or they, you know, they haven't seen themselves as uh, likely targets of this kind of theft, so they're not spending it. So the possibilities are there. All of them are using them? Definitely not. That's why when you see one of these attacks happening, it happens to normally the, 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 the weakest, the weakest protected bank. Mm -hmm. I think there was some other over there. All right, thank you guys.